King Jaehaerys finally made his progress through the Vale of Arryn in 52 AC, stopping at all the places of note before flying Vermothor up the giant's lance to the Eyrie, as Queen Visenya had done during the conquest. Queen Alysanne did accompany him for part of his travels, but not all, as she hadn't fully recovered after childbirth and the grief that had followed, but she still managed to arrange some marriages and held two of her women's courts. The one in Goldtown would change the lords in Westeros forever. These laws would become known as Queen Alysanne's laws, but in reality she had no power to enact them, issue decrees or proclamations. However, like Aegon's queens, Alysanne did wield enormous influence over King Jaehaerys, and when she spoke, he listened, as he did upon their return from the Vale of Arryn. It was applied to widows throughout the seven kingdoms that the women's court had made Alassane aware of. In times of peace, it was not uncommon for a man to outlive his wife, for most young men often die upon the battlefield, and young women giving birth. But men of high birth would often take second wives, whose presence was resented by the children of the first. Upon the man's own death, his heirs could and did often expel the widow from the home. Some might simply strip away the widow's incomes and servants, reducing her to little more than a border. King Jaehaerys in 52 AC proclamated the widow's law, reaffirming the right of the eldest son or daughter where there was no son to inherit, but requiring them to maintain the widow in the same condition that she enjoyed before their husband's death. A lord's widow, be it a second, third or later wife, could no longer be driven from his castle or deprived of her servants, clothing and income. The same law, however, also forbade men from disinheriting their children by their first wives in order to bestow their lands, seat and property upon a later wife or her own children. Building was the king's other concern that year. Work continued on the dragon pit, but whilst riding from Aegon's high hill to the hill of Rainies, the king took note of the poor state of his city. King's Landing had grown too fast, with houses, shops, hovels and rat pits springing up like mushrooms. The streets were closed, dark and filthy, with buildings so close to one another that men could clamber from one window to another. The king told his council if he could knock down the city and start again, he would. But lacking the large amount of coin needed for such a task, the king would do what he could. Streets were widened, straightened and cobbled where possible. The worst hovels were torn down and a great central square was carved and planted with trees, with markets and arcades beneath. From that hub, long wide streets sprung, straight as a spear, the king's way, the god's way, street of sisters and black water way. None of this could be accomplished in a night. Work would continue for years, even decades, throughout Jaehaerys' long reign. The cost of rebuilding the city was not inconsequential and put further strain upon the crown's treasury. Those difficulties were exacerbated by the growing unpopularity of Rigo Draz, master of coin. He had become as widely loathed as his predecessor, though for different reasons altogether. He was said to be corrupt, taking the king's gold to fatten his own purse. He was also said to be godless, as he did not worship the seven. He was also said to be a mongrel, an assertion he could not rightly deny, for all Pentoshi are part Andal and part Valyrian, mixed with the stock of slaves. Most most of all, he was resented for his wealth, which he did not hold back from flaunting. Rigo Draz was an able master of coin, even his enemies could not deny, but the challenge of paying for the completion of Dragon Pit and rebuilding of King's Landing strained even his enormous talents. The taxes on silk and spice were not enough alone, so Lord Rigo reluctantly imposed the gate fee required of anyone entering and leaving the city, collected by the guards on the city gates. Given the amount of traffic that came and went through King's Landing each day, gate tax proved to be highly lucrative, bringing in more than enough coin to meet the need, but at considerable cost Rigo Draz's reputation. A long summer, plentiful harvest, peace and prosperity, both at home and abroad, helped to blunt on the edge of the discontent, however. And as the year drew to a close, Queen Alysanne brought the king some more good news. She was once again with child. This time, she vowed no enemies would come near her. Plans for a second royal progress had already been made and announced before the queen's condition became known. Though Jaehaerys decided that at once he'd remain by his wife's side until the baby was born, Alysanne would not have it and insisted he must go. The new year saw the king taken to the skies once again on Vermithor, this time to the Riverlands. His progress began with a stay at Harrenhal as a guest of its new lord, the nine-year-old Magor Towers. From there, his retinue moved on to Riverrun, Acorn Hall, Pink Maiden, Atrina, and Stony Sep. At his queen's request, Lady Janice Templeton travelled with the king to hold women's courts at Riverrun and Stony Sep in her place. Alistair remained in the Red Keep, presiding over the small council meetings in the king's absence, and holding audience from a velvet seat at the base of the Iron Throne. As the queen's pregnancy progressed, across Blackwater Bay, another woman was delivered of a child whose birth, while less noted, would in time be of great significance to Westeros and the seas that lay beyond. On the Isle of Driftmark, 
Damon Valerian's eldest son became a father for the first time to a healthy boy. The baby was named Corlys after his great great uncle who had served as the Lord Commander of the very first King's Guard. But in the years to come, the people of Westeros would come to know this new Corlys better as the Sea Snake, and he would have a big role to play in the years to come. The Queen's own child followed soon after. This time she gave birth to a strong and healthy child, a girl she named Daenerys. The King was at Stony Sept when word reached him. He immediately mounted Vermifor and flew back to King's Landing at once. Though Jaehaerys had hoped for another son to follow him upon the Iron Throne, it was plain to see that he doted upon his daughter from the moment he first took her in his arms. The realm delighted in the little princess, that is, except on Dragonstone. Arya Targaryen, the daughter of Aegon the Uncrowned and his sister Rhaena, was 11 years of age and had been heir to the Iron Throne as long as she could remember. She delighted in the intention that came with being queen-in-waiting and was not pleased to find out she had been displaced by this newborn princess. Her mother, Queen Rhaena, shared these feelings, but she held her tongue and spoke no word of it, even to her closest confidence. She had trouble enough in her own halls to deal with at the time, as a rift had opened up between her and her beloved Alyssa Farman. Denied any part of the income of Fair Isle by her brother, Lord Franklin, Alyssa asked the Dowager Queen for gold sufficient to build a new ship in the shipyards of Dufmar, a large, swift vessel meant to sail the Sunset Sea. Raina denied her request, saying she could not bear for Alyssa to leave her. Things seemed to be going well for Jaehaerys and the Council, but not one of them realised that the year ahead would be among the darkest in the long reign of Jaehaerys Targaryen, a year marked by death, division and disaster, that the maces and small folk alike would come to call the Year of the Stranger.